welcome all of you, say thank you for coming. Special thank you to Carly Fiorina. I've had the great privilege of working with her on a number of different occasions in recent years, and, and you're in for a real treat. I just want to tell you, this is going to be a special evening. First of all, before we begin, let me just say, when we have public events, uh, we always begin with a safety announcement. I am your responsible safety officer tonight, okay? <laughs> so that means if we have an emergency, you're going to follow me. Uh, we've got right back here, these are the exits, and the stairway is in that corner, and we're going to go down, we're going to go outside, we'll go across to the Beacon Hotel, and I'll buy drinks, okay? <laughs> but we're going to be okay, but do, but if something happens, please follow me. We'll be okay. Let me just say uh, a very sincere thanks to Nina and to Carly, of course, and, and I also want to say thanks to Candy you, for your sponsorship of this. It's, um, this is a very, very popular series for us, and it shows the emotion that we have about finally bringing all of the gene pool into play to help this country. You know, I mean, I, for, we had founding fathers, we had founding mothers too, but we didn't let them in the room at the time, I'm afraid. And, but think of how many problems we would have solved if we'd tapped the full gene pool talent in this country. And we should be also say this is ultimately a mission for the world, but we're glad we can start it here and we have this very impressive program and thank you. Nina, for inventing it for us and giving us a chance to partner with you. Candy, let me turn to you and why don't you say a few words of welcome and thanks again for sitting. I want to thank Dr. Hamry. I'm Candy Wolf. I'm head of Global Government Affairs at City. And uh, this is uh, our fourth event of the Smart Women, Smart Power series, which, which we sponsor with Fortune. <laughs> And since the series kicked off in December, we've welcomed three very impressive women, all of them involved in government to the stage. And so the tradition continues tonight with our first business speaker, <laughs> um, Carly Fiorina. Carly shattered the glass ceiling in 1999 when she was appointed CEO of Hewlett Packard, the first female head of a Fortune 20 company. And today, in a number of different roles that she has, one of them is as Global Chairman of Opportunity International, where she lends her voice and influence to building a network of women, investing in women, to end the cycle of poverty. So I'm proud to say that City, um, more than half of City's workforce is made up of women. But as we know, in the financial services industry, there are not enough women at the highest levels of business. And Carly is certainly a symbol of a woman who's achieved the highest levels of power in a very male-dominated uh, business. And this speaker series, I think, helps to highlight the amazing talent that women bring to government, to business, and to the community. And this gives us an opportunity to highlight those talents. I want to also just mention that today is about one month after International Women's Day. And March 8th is International Women's Day, for those of you that celebrate the day. And throughout the month of March, City hosted over 200 events in 90 countries for our clients, for our employees, and for the communities. And I think today is sort of a natural culmination of what I would say is not so much International Women's Day, but perhaps International Women's Month. And I think it's a, it's a, a testament to the series and to the folks that we have here in this series that we can culminate the month of March with, uh, okay, it's the beginning of April, but you know, it's a month. <laughs> so I'm counting the month. Um, so I wanted to say that City is a proud sponsor of this series, and I want to welcome all of you uh, to tonight's speaker, and I'll turn it over to Kathleen. Thank you. Good evening. I'm Kathleen Hicks. I direct the International Security Program here at CSIS and also oversee the Smart Women, Smart Power Initiative. Um, I'm here in part to relay the most important social media information, which is please make sure you are following us on Twitter at, at @smartwomen. We <laughs> love to add to our Twitter account. It shows the power, as Dr. Hamry said, of expanding the gene pool to uh, lots of great programming that we put through that Twitter feed relating to uh, great things women are doing in international business and international affairs. And also, please check out our Smart Women podcast series on iTunes, which has done tremendously well. And we invite you into the conversations that we have there through that podcast series. Um, I'm very pleased uh, for us to be having tonight Carly Fiorina. She's here to discuss a wide range of topics relating to world affairs, foreign policy, 
international business, technology, microfinance. There's sort of no end to, to the uh, issue sets that she's going to cover, I think, here with Nina. Um, she's currently the chairman of Operational Interna Opportunity excuse me, International, the largest nonprofit microfinance lender in the world. She's also a chairman of Good360, the world's largest product philanthropy organization. And of course, as Candy mentioned, most of you know her as the former chairman and CEO of Hewlett Packard. She also, we hear, may be a candidate for office at some point, so we may hear a little about mm -hmm. that tonight. <clears throat> Our moderator this evening, as always, is Nina Easton, who in addition to being a senior associate here at CSIS, is a columnist for Fortune Magazine and chair of Fortune's Most Powerful Women International Summit. Thanks again to everyone for joining tonight, and Nina, over to you. Great. Well, thank you all for those kind remarks, and Dr. Hamry in particular. Um, it's such an honor here to have Carly Fiorina here. Now, you should also know that uh, you've been at CSIS in other capacities. You have a long history with CSIS. Um, and I guess you probably all know by now uh, about her 90% comment, uh, as in 90% chance that she's going to actually run for president. Uh, so I, we thought it would be a, an incredible opportunity tonight to both get to know Carly even better than people already know her, but also to drill down on foreign policy. I mean, there's been a lot of attention to a lot of d domestic questions, uh, domestic issues that she's addressed as the attention has uh, geared towards you in the last couple weeks. Um, but foreign policy uh, and the role of international business is something we really want to hear from you on. So thank you so much for being here. I'm going to start with a, just sort of a big get to know you. Um, <laughs> You were born in Austin, Texas, and your mother was an abstract artist, and your father was a judge. Talk about two kind of meetings of different minds. <laughs> how, how did that produce you? <laughs> I don't know. You'd have to ask them. But, uh, my, uh, my father was uh, a law professor at the University of Texas. Uh, when I was born, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom, but also an extremely talented artist who kept her light hidden under a bushel for most of her life, but finally went on and got her master's degree in art and started to show some of her art uh, late in her life. Uh, my parents, who had so much to do with who I am and what I believe, but they met um, during World War II um, in Texas. Uh, my mother was the secretary to the CEO. Uh, and had run away from home at 18 because her father didn't think she should go to college. Hmm. So she ran away from home and met my dad. Uh, I learned very important things from both my mother and father. My mother told me when I was about eight years old in Sunday school one Sunday that what you are is God's gift to you and what you make of yourself is your gift to God. And to me, that was a promise and a challenge all at the same time. It was a promise that I had gifts, even though I didn't know what they were. And it was a challenge to find them and make the most of them. My father was um, a conservative of great integrity. And I would sit and watch the news with him every night. He would yell at the television, you know. <laughs> Um, he would get very wrapped up in politics, but he was one of these people who, when he went on uh, to the federal bench um, on the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, he got along with everyone, even though not everyone agreed with him. So I learned from him that you can have really strong core principles, but also find common ground with lots of people. And he said, you know, Carly, your integrity and your reputation are your most important possession don't ever sell them. Mm -hmm. And that's an important lesson yeah. to learn at a young age. And you ended up at the very pinnacle of the business community, a uh, first woman to run a Fortune 50 company, actually, ended up on the cover of our magazine, Fortune. Um, but it didn't, you, you took kind of a circuitous route there. You graduated from Stanford, you went to UCLA Law School, and then you quit after a year. Yeah. Why? Well, circuitous route is a nice way to say it. It was a really <laughs> inauspicious beginning, honestly. Uh, I did graduate from Stanford, but I had a degree in medieval history and philosophy. 
<laughs> so what that meant was all dressed up and nowhere to go. I mean, <laughs> and um, so I went off to law school. I, you know, my dad really thought it would be great if I followed in his footsteps and I adored him and so I thought that would be a good idea. I just hated law school. I hated it. I, I, I think it was Judge Learned Hand that put me over the edge for all of you <laughs> lawyers in the room, but I felt somehow that all the emphasis on precedent wasn't very interesting to me. And so I quit after one semester. In fact, I didn't even make it through the first semester. So imagine what my resume reads now. Uh, so I had to earn a living, and I went back to work doing full-time what I had done part-time to put myself through Stanford. Stanford was an, a very expensive school, and I had to work uh, during my time there. I was a secretary. Uh, I was a Kelly girl, temporary office personnel. And uh, I typed in the shipping department of Hewlett Packard. I did all kinds of things. So I went back to work as a secretary full-time for a nine-person real estate firm and really had no idea what I was going to do with my life, but was grateful to be paying the rent. But you did end up getting an MBA from the University of Maryland. Eventually I did. And you did, and you started, and your corporate rise began at AT&T in, in 1990. And describe those years. Well, uh, 1980, actually. I'm sorry, 1980. Um, would that I were that young, but <laughs> anyway. Uh, <laughs> So I, um, I have to say that it, it's a lesson that stayed with me. When I was at that little nine-person real estate firm, two men who worked there came to my desk one day and said, you know, we've been watching you, and we think you could do more than type and file. Do you want to know what we do? And really, they put me on this path to even consider business. Nothing in my background would have caused me to think about a career in business. And what I remember about that is the trajectory of my life changed. It took a turn in a different direction because two men took a chance on me. They took a chance on me. And everybody needs somebody to take a chance on them, at least once in their life. I've had people take chances on me all throughout my life. Um, my very first job when I finally got an MBA was right here in Washington, D.C. at 20th and L. I was hired by AT&T when it was the Bell System, a million mm -hmm. employees, and I was hired as a entry-level salesperson. And um, my job, I was kind of a sales trainee person, and my job was to sell telephone systems to government agencies. Hmm. That's when I learned all those many years ago that at the end of every fiscal year, in the last six weeks, every government agency spends every last dime, <laughs> no matter what. And it continues. Yes. And so to jump forward here a bit, you um, then 1999, um, you're, you're chosen to lead Hewlett Packard. Um, and did somebody take a chance on you in, in taking that job, by the way? Well, every, you know, all of us do something for the first time. Yeah. And that was the first time I was a CEO. And there was and a so, lot of attention. I mean. It, as a woman, I mean, a just, huge it, amount it of attention. And in retrospect, this sounds foolish for me to say, but honestly, I was completely unprepared for how much attention there was. I, I had spent my career uh, moving up. Not, I didn't have a plan to become a CEO. I just learned over time that I would run to problems. If there was a problem, if there was a challenge, I ran to it because I found it more interesting. And I learned that if there was a problem, there were also people who knew how to fix the problem. It's just they'd never been asked. Their potential had never been tapped. And so I would go into a problem situation, and I would find people with potential that had not been tapped and focus them on, let's solve this problem. Let's capture this opportunity. And we did. And when you do that, when you run to problems and solve them, people pay attention. Um, and so I had worked my way up and had never thought about myself as a woman in business, even though the vast majority of the meetings I was in were only men. And I would routinely find women in organizations whose potential was being ignored. 
and give them a chance, and we would do good things. In any event, when I arrived at Hewlett Packard, I honestly thought that the questions people would ask me would be about maybe that I was the first outsider to ever lead this storied technology company. Or maybe the questions would be about the fact that I wasn't an engineer and all the previous CEOs had been engineers. Or maybe the questions would be, what are your plans for this company? How do you plan to grow it since now it was known when I arrived as the gray lady of Silicon Valley because it was losing relevance and wasn't growing and wasn't innovating? I thought I would be asked all those questions. And instead, the question I was asked, or the statement that was made was, oh my gosh, you're a woman. <laughs> and it caught me completely off guard. And the attention that was paid to me because I was a woman never really abated. And you had, you had a tremendous um, run of success at HP um, for the five and a half years there, but you were also abruptly fired, as you say, yeah. by the board. Yeah. Uh, and you know, the business press at the time talked about an earnings slump and so forth. You also, in your book, talk about just kind of a sexism to, um, in some way, the way you were portrayed. Um, what in your mind was it? Well, I think first, the, it, it is true that when you are leading to change the order of things, and that's what leadership is about. Leadership fundamentally is about two things. It's not about position or power or title or perks. Leadership is about unlocking potential in others just like those two men did for me many, many years ago. And it's about changing the order of things for the better. That's what leadership is. And so when you change the order of things for the better, it means you are taking on established orders. You're taking on the status quo. You're taking on the conventional wisdom. And so if you lead, you will make enemies. It's the nature of leadership. Um, in the course of my time there, we, and it's always we, we accomplished really extraordinary things. We took a company from 44 billion to 88 billion. We went from 2% growth to 9% growth. We went from not being even counted anymore in the top 25 innovators in the world to tripling our rate of innovation to 11 patents a day. We quadrupled our cash flow. We went from lagging behind in every product category to leading in every product category. We grew a company by innovating. We, of course, created jobs, because you can't create jobs unless you're growing and innovating. And in a technology company in particular, if you're not leading and growing, you're lagging and falling behind. Some of the moves that we made to accomplish that were controversial. At the time, we acquired Compaq. It was mm -hmm. the largest acquisition in technology history. It was the most complex integration in technology history, also very successful acquisition. But we did that at the, uh, in the middle of the biggest technology recession in 25 years, and it was completely against conventional wisdom. Because the conventional wisdom in 2001 was that the era of technology that would follow would be the same as the era that had preceded the dot-com bust. And the era that preceded the dot-com bust was the pure play era. You were a pure play router company, a pure play PC company, a pure play consumer company, a pure play software company. And we said, actually, no, the future belongs to diversified technology companies that will consolidate the industry and lead not just in scope and scale, but in innovative capacity. That turned out to be right, but it was against conventionalism. I was fired at the end of that because we had a couple board members who were leaking confidential board information. You can't do that in a board. And uh, I said, either this stops or I have to go. There was a boardroom tussle. It was all over in 10 days, uh, and I left. I could have prevented leaving by casting a vote as chairman of the board. I didn't cast my vote as chairman of the board because I thought it was really important that the board work through what conduct was becoming of that board for the good of the institution. And interestingly, in the year that followed, a lot of board members were fired themselves. Right. There was great tumult and great 
controversy about how the board did business, and um, it was probably best for the company that all that come out. And do you think this, the way things ended at HP, is that going to hurt you politically? Uh, I don't think so, but I think people need to know the facts. You know, one of the things that is good about business um, is there are actually facts. There are numbers. They're indisputable. The results are indisputable. Sometimes I think politics is a fact-free zone. <laughs> you know? Um, I also think that that's what people are sick of about politics. I think people are kind of sick of no facts. I think they're sick of no results. I think they're sick of a lot of sound bites and vitriol going back and forth, but somehow the order of things never really changes yeah. for the better. So I'm going to, unfortunately, we, since our time is limited, briefly go through a couple other years and then turn to foreign policy. But you, um, you, uh, you did a Senate race against uh, Barbara Boxer, obviously um, lost. You also faced uh, breast cancer. You mm -hmm. have that battle. Um, talk about the lessons from that period. So uh, the Senate run in California, uh, yes, I certainly lost the general election. Um, we had a three-way primary, um, and I came from way behind in that three-way primary and won with about 57% of the vote. So I understand what it takes to unify a party, and while, of course, I lost in the end, I also gained more Republican votes, more Democratic votes, and more independent votes than virtually anyone else running anywhere in the nation that year. That's how big California is. And what that taught me is that if you talk to people in terms they understand, about the problems they actually face and are authentic about what you believe and how you would approach problems, you can both unify a party and reach beyond a party. I also learned that I love to campaign, which is helpful, you know, if you're going to run, say, for president <laughs> of the United States. Um, what do you love about campaigning? You know what I love about campaigning is I find people fascinating. And when you are campaigning for yourself or for others. I've spent a lot of time since 2010 campaigning for others and helping other people win. And you meet all kinds of people in all kinds of places. And they have fears and concerns and hopes. And what I'm struck by now is, I'll digress for a moment and tell a story unassociated with politics. I happened to be in a homeless women's shelter in New York last Monday, a week ago. I was there in association with some of my charity work. And this is a women's shelter that rotates between a Catholic church and a Jewish synagogue every other night, which says wonderful things about uh, that community. And I'm speaking to this woman who is a guest there. They call them guests, as they should. And she said, you're somebody. <laughs> and um, I said, well, I'm Carly Fiorina. You're running or something? And so I explained that maybe I would run. And she said, you know, all these, this is what she did, all these politicians up here, they're in their world, and they're talking in their language. And they're not connected to those of us down here, except that what they're talking about and what they're doing about up here, it impacts those of us down here. That's as concise a definition of the disconnect that people feel between their lives and the political process as I've ever heard. And then she said, keep talking. We're listening. Hmm. So you know, you run into people like that. Mm -hmm. And here's a woman in really difficult circumstances, and yet she was not hopeless. She was hopeful, she was concerned, she was worried, of course. But one of the reasons she was hopeful, I think, is because people were giving her a helping hand, people were taking a chance on her. And when you take a chance on someone, basically what you're saying to them is you have value. You have value. Yeah. And you can live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. 
And in the end, I think that is the highest calling of leadership. You are a very advocate. You are a very avid advocate of the free market globally, as well as in the United States. And um, yep, uh, Pope Francis says the free market um, is creating a, economies of exclusion and, and inequality. What do you say back to that? Yeah. Well, because I think what we have now is less and less free market and more and more crony capitalism. And crony capitalism is what happens when you have big government get bigger and bigger and more complicated so that only big business can thrive. And big business uses the processes of big government to advantage its competitive position. I mean, that's what we have going on. And we have it going on all over the world. Um, the only way to level the playing field is to lessen the power and the complexity and the reach of both big government and big business. So How do you I do think that internationally? Well, I can't speak for what other countries are doing, but we can do something about it here. I mean, th this is an, a partisan comment I'm about to make. It's a fact. If you look at Dodd-Frank, whatever you think of Dodd-Frank, whatever you think of the motivations behind Dodd-Frank, the result of Dodd-Frank has been that Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, who were a big source of the financial crisis, continue without any reform at all. Ten banks too big to fail have become five banks too big to fail, and their competitive position is stronger, not weaker, and the systemic risk to the system is arguably greater, not less. Meanwhile, 26 regulatory agencies that were supposed to be overseeing the financial system haven't been reformed in any way. We've just added a new one. And 3,000 community banks have gone out of business and counting. So what happens with big, powerful, complicated, complex government is only the big, the powerful, the wealthy, and the well-connected can thrive. And the small, and the powerless, and the unconnected get crushed. And that's what ha what's happening. And it matters when we're destroying community banks, for example, but because they are the places that lend a helping hand to so many family-owned businesses and small businesses, which still are the engine of economic growth in this country. Most Americans start the way I did, in a little business. My husband started as a tow truck driver in a family-owned mm. auto body shop. That's how most Americans start. So when we're crushing small businesses, when we're creating a system when only the big and the powerful and the wealthy and the well-connected can make it, then we have economic growth at 2%, not 4%. We have a stagnation of wages. We don't have enough jobs being created. That's what's going on. So I think there are so many people who believe that the current brand of capitalism yeah. is free markets. Our market here is less and less free. But when you talk about the powerless, um, something that would probably impact people's lives here would be, say, bringing home that $2 trillion in reserves cash sitting on the corporate balance sheets of big companies abroad. Um, and something else that might help them is, is the whole role of technology. I mean, technology is displacing jobs, we all agree. Um, how would you tackle those kinds of problems to help uh, income growth at home? So first of all, both of those things, you're absolutely right, and, and I will address both of those things, but I will start by saying that we really cannot underestimate the historic role that family businesses, small businesses, startup businesses have played in this economy. So you know, we were really proud of 11 patents a day at Hewlett Packard, small companies, new companies innovated 11 times the rate of big companies. And they innovate at a much faster rate because big companies tend to be big bureaucracies. And big bureaucracies crush innovation over time. Small companies tend to be willing to make mistakes, take risks. And if you want innovation, you've got to tolerate mistake making. Small and new businesses create two thirds of the new jobs in this country. They employ half the people. So if you go to any community anywhere in this country, you will see small and family-owned businesses giving up. And it's of huge consequence. We're now, for the first time in US history, think about this. Here's a fact. 
For the first time in US history, <clears throat> we are now destroying more businesses than we are creating. That's a terrible problem that impacts everybody. So now to your point, mm -hmm. yes, there, why, why do these big corporations not bring their cash home? Because it will get taxed at exorbitant rates and their profits are already being taxed. So we should, of course, have a competitive tax rate in this country for everybody. We don't. It's, in the 21st century, any job can go anywhere, money can go anywhere, ideas can go anywhere, people can go anywhere. So therefore, we have to compete for every job. We have to be the country that's the best place in the world to build a new business. We have to be the country that's the best in the world to do business. And we're not if our tax rates are uncompetitive. So we have to lower every rate. But beyond that, we have to vastly simplify the tax code. It's not enough to keep tweaking it and changing it and making it better, but never simplify it. Because the big companies can deal with big, complicated tax codes. The little guys can't. As a, as a CEO, I could hire accountants, lobbyists, lawyers to deal with all this complexity. A nine-person real estate firm, not so much. So yes, we should change the tax code so that money comes home. We could even incent companies to use that money for specific purposes, for retraining people, for helping startups get going. But if we don't simplify the tax code, if all we do is worry about the rates, we're not going to make enough progress in terms of leveling the playing field for the small and the powerless against the big and the powerful. Technology is an unbelievable tool for innovation. And it's interesting because it is technology that small startups are trying to use to gain competitive advantage. So, you know, all of you know about Uber, or all of you know about Airbnb, but think about it. What are the competitors to Uber and Airbnb trying to do? They're trying, big companies, are getting together with regulators and government entities to try and make their entrance into the marketplace harder. Mm -hmm. Why? Because their entrance into the marketplace disadvantages the big established players. That's the kind of disruption we want in our economy. Government shouldn't be used to crush competition. And that's actually what's happening in our economy. So let's turn to national security. Um, obviously, at the top of the headlines right now is the Iranian nuclear framework agreement. Um, the president over the weekend argues that this is our best bet for keeping nuclear weapons out of the hands of Tehran. What's your response to that? Well, I think we, my own view is we should have stopped talking to Iran after the first six month deadline passed. And the reason I say that is because we have been sending signals to Iran and to everyone else in the world that bad behavior will be rewarded. Why do I say that? Think about Iran's behavior over decades. Iran has had a strategy to destabilize the Middle East through their proxies. Iran has had a strategy to gain a nuclear weapon. Iran has had a strategy to stonewall every inspection regime that has been put in place. And Iran has had a strategy to stonewall every negotiating effort. We're rewarding all of that behavior. I also think that tactically, from a negotiating point of view, it's a huge error for um, the President of the United States to declare victory in a Rose Garden ceremony when only a framework agreement has been decided. Because what that signals is that this president is now committed publicly to getting this deal done. And so my prediction is that what the Iranians will do on the other side is spend the next two months trying to get a better deal. That's what happens in negotiations. I I've never negotiated an Iranian nuclear deal, but I've negotiated plenty of deals, big deals. And when you want a good deal, you have to be willing to walk away from the table. <laughs> You've got to be willing to walk away from the table. And you can't get so committed publicly that uh, it doesn't really matter what deal you get. And I'm afraid that's what's happening. Finally, I would say 
there are people at the negotiating table with us whose side I'm not sure they're on. So Russia. Russia is not on our side in this negotiation. Russia has a very keen national interest in building up their nuclear industry. And the way they do that is to become the supplier and partner of choice to Iran. And they are well on their way to doing that. So I think we should have stopped talking a long time ago. I think we should have pushed back on some of their behavior. But if we are going to go forward with this new deal now, then I believe we must insist on inspections first and compliance first before sanctions are lifted. Because once sanctions are lifted, there will be no snap back. You cannot snap back when six different parties are at the table. You cannot snap back when industries rush in. So I think inspection first, verification first, and then uh, perhaps unleash this, um, unload what, the same. What about the whole process, though, of engaging a foe in the first place? We hear this weekend, again, about the Obama doctrine, where he says, we engage, but we preserve all our options and capabilities. What's the Fiorina? doctrine on foes like Iran? Well, I think before we engage with anyone, we have to be consistent about rewarding good behavior and recognizing bad behavior. And my fear is that we are sending exactly the opposite set of signals. So I mentioned we're rewarding bad behavior on the part of Iran. I think it's indisputable that we're rewarding bad behavior. No matter what the Iranians do, no matter that they're engaged in a bloody civil war now in Yemen, no matter what their proxies do throughout the region, nothing changes in our posture towards them. That sends a signal to every other adversary we have. On the flip side, we are not standing with our allies and rewarding good behavior. So example, when the Kurds, the most um, capable fighting force in the region, when the Kurds step forward and fight against ISIS, and we refuse to arm them as they have, they have requested for over a year and a half, what signal are we sending? The signal we're sending is it doesn't really pay to be our friend. When the Jordanian king, whom I've known for many years, but when King Abdullah flies back to Jordan and promptly beheads, uh, not beheads, promptly executes two convicted terrorists in retaliation for the burning alive of a Jordanian pilot and then begins bombing, and he has just left Washington, D.C., where he was asking for bombs and materiel to support him, and we don't provide it, which we still have not. What signal are we sending? When the president of Egypt, not a perfect character by any matter of means, but when the president of Egypt takes action in retaliation for the beheading of 21 Coptic Christians, or bravely goes to the heart of Cairo and speaks to the imams about the cancer that he believes as a pious Muslim is sitting in the heart of Islam and that they need to help deal with it, and responds bravely as well uh, into all that's going on in the region, and we say we neither condemn nor condone his actions, what signal are we sending? So we have allies in the Middle East. We have allies in the Baltic states. We have allies in Ukraine who are asking us to do very specific things that would be helpful, and we are doing none of it. And so the signal we send is, it's a tough game to be America's friend. And the signal also is, if you behave badly, there are no consequences. There are only rewards. And that has huge consequence for this nation. And I think the world's a very dangerous and tragic place when we're not leading. You know a number of world leaders, uh, Putin among them. Explain to us your, uh, your meetings and so forth with him. Well, I met Putin at an APEC meeting 
And uh, Putin is a very formidable, very interesting man. First of all, he's highly intelligent, highly educated, very cosmopolitan, quite charming. If he was here, he would be charming and entertaining. He actually has a very good sense of humor. He is formidable. He is also a man who is focused on power. Not even ideology, power. Economic power, political power, territorial power. And he believes it is his mission to restore the historic power of the Russian Empire. So if that's who you are facing off against, it doesn't take a lot to understand that someone like that will not be stopped unless he senses real strength and resolve and purpose on the other side. And so again, we have the Ukrainians asking for our help. We have the Baltic states asking for our help. And we're not providing much help. And so I doubt that Vladimir Putin will stop. There's no reason for him to stop. He actually is achieving his objectives. Yeah. Um, so you've met him once? Or yes, we had, once a, and yes we had a, a rather lengthy meeting. And um, I have done this? business in, in Russia for some time. And I would say that um, he is a man who has effectively concentrated so much power in his person, it's really um, stunning. What He's been the, very effective at it. What about the Chinese leadership? You've spent time with them as yes. well. Well, I, I've been doing business in China um, for a couple decades now. And the Chinese are motivated first and foremost by what they perceive to be in their nation's economic self-interest. Their economic self-interest requires them to grow at a certain rate, to lift a certain number of people out of poverty, because they have figured out that um, political peace and social peace requires a certain standard of living. That's the bargain they've kind of made with the Chinese people. We will crush freedoms. Uh, and in return, you will have a reasonable standard of living. That bargain is fraying at the edges in very real ways. But because they are motivated only by their economic self-interest, there's a lot of things that we talk to them about that they really don't care what we think. They don't care what we think about their human rights record. They really don't care. And so however objectionable we may find their human rights record, we're wasting our breath. They actually don't care when we say that we think they're manipulating their currency. They think we are manipulating our currency. By the way, I would agree with them. QE1, QE2, QE3 has had the effect, in many ways, of manipulating our currency. And so uh, we have to talk to them. If we want to change their behavior, the only thing that changes their behavior is to begin to have an impact on their calculation about their economic self-interest. And in this regard, we have leverage, although we rarely use it. We are their largest market. Virtually all of their industry has been built one way or another through collaboration with leading edge American companies. And so uh, there are real conversations we must have with them about the systematic pilfering of our intellectual property. I was going to ask you about this. But we're not really student. having them. <laughs> what, what would you do? Would you well, use I the WTO to stand up to them on that? Really, honestly, what I would do uh, first, uh, yes, I think the WTO is in some ways a useful body. But I would remind the Chinese that it, it is the American business community that helped the Chinese enter the WTO. I would gather a set of American business leaders who also are very concerned about what is happening to their intellectual property. And I would form a united front between the policies that the US government pursues and a set of American businesses. Um, 
I think that would have an impact. I would change the nature of the topics about which we speak to the Chinese, and I would ensure that there are real consequences to some of their behavior. By the way, there's no doubt I chaired the advisory board at the Central Intelligence Agency for several years, have served on the defense business boards. There is no doubt that the Chinese are engaged in very deliberate cyber warfare, whatever you want to call it, against both government and business in this, in this country. There's no doubt they're doing that. So um, I am going to open this up to questions in about five minutes, so get them ready. But I wanted to drill down a little deeper on your views about the use of force. Looking, and let's, let's look backward before we look forward. Um, the Iraq War, knowing what we know now, would you have authorized that? Knowing what we know now, of course not. And we, I think, even if we assumed now, looking back, okay, they had weapons of mass destruction, I think we mismanaged that conflict. We mismanaged going in, and we have mismanaged going out. I think um, the use of force, as well as American leadership on the world stage, requires uh, both clear-eyed realism and moral clarity. And what I mean by clear-eyed realism is, let's just take Afghanistan, which in some ways was a clearer case. We had a major terrorist attack launched, plotted, and planned from there. Clearly, there had to be a response, a forceful response. That was realistic. It was totally unrealistic to decide that the mission we needed to be engaged in was to build a central government where none had existed for 2,000 years, that was completely unrealistic. And so we were imposing a model of political governance on a nation in which that model would never take root. Uh, and so I think force is always a last resort, and when it is used, it must be used for a very limited purpose. Now what about... But there is a time. Syria, uh, you know, containing ISIS and so forth, do you favor American troops there? Well, I think one of the things that I think, honestly, this uh, administration has done is continually present the American people with a false choice. And the false choice is this, either we go to war or there's nothing we can do. And I think Syria is an example of where that false choice has been offered over and over again. There are things we could have done in Syria. We could have provided more help to the rebels when there were moderate rebels there. We could have joined together more effectively with Turkey instead of fighting against the things that Turkey wanted to do. We did none of that. Right. And but of course, looking at now, it now, now yeah. we're at a point, well, you see, I think here again, a false choice is being offered. Uh, no, I think sending American troops boots on the ground into Syria at this moment would be counterproductive. On the other hand, we have a whole bunch of allies in that region asking us to do things, and we're not doing any of them. We're not working effectively with the Turks. We're not working effectively with the Kurds. We're not working effectively with the rebels. We're not working effectively with the Jordanians or the Saudis or the Kurds. We're not working effectively with any of our allies. And so to say the only thing we can do is go off to war isn't true. There are a whole set of things we've been asked to do by people who share our interests, and we're not doing that. Okay, questions. Um, please identify yourself and keep your question very short, and it must end in a question mark. <laughs> um, back there, yes. It's January, and it is 2018. Your president elect, excuse me, it's January, it's 2018. Your president elect, what are your first Wait, decisions and priorities? 2017. 2017, excuse sorry, me. January 2017, and what, I'm sorry? President elect. Yeah. What are the first decisions and priorities you would make? I think the first decision I would make is to begin to undo a whole set of complexities that have been built up. And let's just start with the web of dependence that we have woven around people's lives. 
We have woven a web of dependence around people's lives. And we make it virtually impossible for people to disentangle themselves from that web. All of the incentives are to settle into that web instead of to move forward in your life. So I would start to undo and disentangle a whole set of complexities around dependence. And I would uh, start to disentangle a whole set of programs that crush the family owned and the small businesses. Undoing things is hard. Um, but I think using technology and pressure from the American people, we could get those things done. Secondly, I would begin the push for two important levers that can help us reimagine government and hold it more accountable to serve all citizens. And those two things would be this. Zero-based budgeting. Let us know where our money is actually being spent. We don't have a clue. We don't have a clue. And the appropriation process each and every year is around the rate of increase. Because all, remember that fiscal year I talked about? Everybody spends every last dime the last six weeks of fiscal year. That's been going on for 40 years under Republicans and Democrats. Because we never look at the whole budget. And transparency over time will lead to accountability. So zero-based budget. The other one, pay for performance. We have lived with a seniority system in the federal government forever. It's a bad system because it means that literally you can watch pornography all day long or you can be working hard to do a good job and you get paid exactly the same way and earn the same pay and the same benefits. That's not fair. It's not right. And people outside this town find it outrageous. OK, other questions? Thank you. My name is Paolo von Schirach, editor of the Schirach Report. About the web of dependence that you adequately uh, described a moment ago, you would like to disentangle the country or the people who are dependent after you were president. What about before? In other words, what is the message that can be conveyed to the people who are dependent and that you would like them to be disentangled, but you still want their votes? How do, you trans how do you modify from dependence to opportunity? What is the message? Good question. Everyone has God-given gifts. Everyone has potential. Most people have far more than they realize. It's not a message, it's a fact. And I've seen it play out in my life over and over and over again. When you give people a chance to find their gifts and use their potential, the vast majority of people will take that chance. It is a human instinct to live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. It's what all human beings want. And so when you look somebody in the eye and you say, you have value, you have gifts, you have potential, and the highest calling of leadership is to unlock potential in others. Let's help everyone in this country live a life of dignity and purpose and meaning. This used to be a country of limitless possibility, and it has to be again. This has to be a nation where every American feels possibilities in their lives, because they have possibilities. They have potential. And the weight of bad government, bad policy, and bad politics is crushing it for too many people. When you look at both the global economy, two-part question, and the national security landscape, what worries you the most on both of those? What, what, what scares you? I think what scares me is what motivates me to potentially jump into this race. I think we are at a very pivotal point. I think there comes a point where a system is so baked in that you can't reverse it. And I think we're coming to that point. Government getting bigger 
and bigger and more and more complicated and more and more powerful and more and more crushing has been baked into this system for 40 years. And unless we decide to take a different path to reach for a different result, there will come a point where we can't change it. Example, let me give you a very practical example. In the next few years, there are a bunch of baby boomers who are going to retire from their jobs in the federal government. It is a window of opportunity. We either decide we are not replacing those people and reimagining government to be smaller and more accountable and more responsive and less oppressive, or we replace them all. And then we're stuck for a really long time. With regard to the world, I think it's the same thing. I worry that we are getting to a point where without American leadership, the world will look very different. The world will look very different if our allies in the Middle East become weaker and our adversary in the Middle East, which is Iran and its proxies, become very much stronger. The world will look very different if Vladimir Putin continues on his march for power. Our nation will look very different if we don't get more family-owned and small businesses going and growing again. Our nation will look different if we're not tapping the talents and the possibilities of every American. And so I think we have a limited time to change the order of things for the better. I truly do. We have time for a couple more questions. Um, way back there, yes? Sir? Thank you very much. <clears throat> My name is Neal Chotut. Let's go to Africa, for example. In East Africa, South Sudan is in civil war right now for almost a year. The government in Juba, in South Sudan, has been committed a genocide against one ethnic community. Now, we also had a killing in Kenya. What would you do if you could be, if you will be elected? Um, I'm not sure I understood all of your question. Uh, I'm sorry, but I think you were asking, you were talking about the civil war in Sudan, and you were also talking uh, about uh, Kenya. Were you talking about the, the attack in Kenya? Is that what you're, OK, yes. I'm sorry. I, so um, the attack in Kenya is a demonstration of the um, growing nature of the terrorist threat that we face. And there is a religious um, message at the core of this threat. Um, <clears throat> we need to be sharing intelligence with all of those who would work with us to fight this terrorist threat. Um, I think there's no question that um, when people are not sure of where we stand and who we stand with, it makes those who want to stand up and fight bravely less eager to do so. Uh, and so, again, we can't send troops into everywhere. But what we can do is help those who are trying to help us in this fight. We can be clear and deliberate about our willingness to stand with those who are willing to fight those who would harm us and others. We can be clear about the nature of the threat that we face and stand with those who are brave enough to name the threat we face. And I think we can be active as a nation in building economies all throughout the world, including in Africa. You know, one of the uh, projects that I was engaged in here at CSIS was about global development. And there's no question that it is in our interests 
that economies all around the world develop and that people have a stake in the global economy. And one of the conclusions, without going too far into this, but one of the conclusions that this project, which I had the pleasure to co-chair, came to was that private companies are now responsible for over three quarters of the development efforts that are going on in Africa and elsewhere around the world. And there's a real opportunity for government efforts and private sector efforts to be more aligned so that we have a bigger impact in economies like Africa. Africa, as you well know, is a place where the Chinese are investing hugely through their governments and their businesses. And we are perceived as withdrawing, withdrawing in terms of our support for allies and friends, and withdrawing in terms of our investment for economic development as well. Carly, as we end here, I, um, I want to ask you a question about leadership. You've, you've, because you've, you've experienced it in, on so many levels. You've thought about it globally on so many levels. Uh, and part of this program is um, geared towards aspiring leaders, women, but young men too. I mean, what would be your best advice to aspiring leaders based on your experience? Well, first I would say know what leadership is and know what it isn't. And people get very confused about leadership. I said several minutes ago that leadership isn't about position and power. I used to think it was. I mean, when I was a secretary, I thought whoever had the biggest office was a leader. If you had the big office, the big perks, the big parking space, the big budget, you were a leader. And I think a lot of people think that. They think title and position and power equals leadership. And they have nothing to do with it. There are plenty of people with big offices who don't lead. I also think leadership is different than management. Management is about doing the best you can within the existing system. There are a lot of people in business who are managers. There are a lot of people in philanthropy who are managers. There are a lot of people in politics who are managers. They just do the best they can within the existing system. Leaders don't accept what's broken just because it's been that way for a really long time. So understand that leadership is about changing the order of things for the better. It's about changing things. It's about particularly unlocking potential in others, because that's how you solve problems. It's how you change the order of things. Human potential is the only limitless resource we have, but it is limitless. And when you apply human potential to solve problems, really, honestly, everything is possible. I have never encountered a problem that couldn't be made better by unlocking human potential and focusing it on common goals and worthy purpose. So when we leave potential on the table, because we don't give people a chance to use it, when we leave potential on the table because we just ignore women or minorities or people who are different, then we're not going to solve all of our problems and we're not going to tap all of our opportunities. So understand what leadership is and understand one other thing that I know from my own experience. Leaders are made, they're not born. Leaders are made. Leaders are made through the crucible of challenges. Challenges that are professional or challenges that are personal. You know, you asked me about cancer um, a moment ago and uh, I forgot to answer you, but um, all of us are formed not just by the good times but by the bad times. I learned a lot uh, battling cancer. Most particularly I learned that you know, life and success aren't measured in time. They're not measured by title. Life is measured in love and moments of grace and positive contribution, truly. And I learned when our younger daughter died battling the demons of addiction that the only thing we really control are our own choices which comes back to leadership. I think actually fundamentally leadership is a choice. It's a choice to make a positive difference. It's a choice to unlock potential in others. It's a choice to have the courage to say, I'm not going to accept this just because it's been this way all along. I'm going to choose to change the order of things for the better. So many people don't choose leadership, not because they're not capable of it, but because there's a price to be paid for leadership. You make enemies. You disrupt things. Not everybody likes what you're doing. You take arrows in the back. You're always going to get criticized. That's the price of leadership. And yet everybody can. 
And it is a joy to see people choose to lead. Well, Carly, I met you at CSIS when you were providing remarkable leadership on global development issues and incorporating the private sector. So it's a delight to talk to you today as you take that, that leadership gene you have and you're taking it to new heights. So thank you so much for taking the time to be with us. Thank you. Thanks for joining us.